So now without further ado, I'd like to call upon Sheikh Mustah Khan to please give us a very important talk about gender relations. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I had Timmy's for breakfast. I hope you guys had a good breakfast as well. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een. Allahumma allimna bima yanfa'una wa anfa'una bima allamtana wa zidna ilman ya kareem. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli thumma amma ba'd. So... My topic for you today, insha'Allah ta'ala, is gender relations in Islam. And just to further um, sort of emphasize what the topic is about, these are the little things that make life very complicated, and for many of us living in this part of the world, uncomfortable. Where you have to deal with the opposite gender in your daily life. Going to school, going to work, whatever social setting you're dealing with, the opposite gender is in front of you. So for the young brothers and sisters who are at college or uni or even in high school, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to lower your gaze. How are you supposed to do that when your professor is a woman or is a man? Allah said, lower your gaze, so how do you stare at her? And especially, what if she's wearing like a, a short skirt or something and you're, you're sitting there and you're taking math class? How do you do that? Then for many of the brothers and sisters who work in mixed environments, your boss is a lady, the president is a man, he wants you to come in his office and he wants to work on a project with you or assign you a project for the company. How are you supposed to do that? To what level do you have that engagement or that conversation with the opposite gender? I want to start off by saying our culture, Muslim culture, generally speaking around the world, We've taken this gender relations topic to a whole nother level. You can go online and find fatawa after fatawa of ulama saying to you, it is haram for you to go to a university here in the West. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. You can probably look at that fatwa in several different ways. But for the average Muslim, when they read that fatwa, guess what they're going to do? They're going to wake up the next day and where are they going to go? They're going to go to school. They're just going to get right back into the classroom again. Because what other option do you have? So for me personally, I don't 100% disagree with this. I just don't think it's practical enough for you and I to implement in our lifestyle here. We still need an education. Without an education, you can't have a job. And even without the job thing in there, just the fact of you educating yourself and becoming better people, this is your only option. Otherwise, where are you going to go? Where are you going to study? How are you going to better yourself? How are you going to educate yourself? The second dilemma with this gender relations is the Muslim culture has taken it to such a level to the point now that it's very uncomfortable for men and women, Muslim men and women to communicate with each other. You'll see like a brother, we'll see a hijabi, and he's like, أعوذ بالله من الحجاب الرجيم. He doesn't want to be near the hijab. And when the hijabi is there in front of him, he's literally staring at his shoelace the whole conversation. And she's just crying her eyes out and she's giving her problems and he can't look at her. Why? Because it's just haram or he doesn't want to take it to that level. So we've created the situation now that amongst ourselves, we can't communicate with the opposite gender. We just completely separate them. So here's what I'd like to do with all of you. What is Quran's response or solution to all of these dilemmas? How does Quran teach you and I to deal with the opposite gender? Believe it or not, Quran is very beautiful and very explicit about this particular topic. 
I want to bring your attention to verses 30 and 31 in Surah An-Nur. The famous verses that all the khatibs and lecturers, when they talk to you about lowering your gaze and controlling your actions, they will say to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and then until the end of the ayah. Tell believing men, lower your gaze, protect the privates. That is pure for them. Allah is fully well aware of what you manufacture and do. I want to sort of give you a perspective to think about when you look at these verses. Here's the first point. These verses were revealed in a context that had nothing to do with sexual desire. Everybody with me? Previously, if you just reverse and go back a few ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah An-Nur, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تَدْخُلُوا بُيُوتًا غَيْرَ بُيُوتِكُمْ حَتَّى تَسْتَأْنِسُوا وَتُسَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَهْلِهَا Allah Azza wa Jal says that when you want to visit somebody or enter their home, do two things. Believers, do two things when you visit somebody's house. Number one, say assalamu alaikum. Number two, is seek permission. You don't just waltz into somebody's house and be like, I'm here. You can't even go to your mom's house or your parents' house or your children's house and just waltz in there and be like, well, I'm your mom. I can walk in here anytime I want. You can't do that. Allah said, استأنسو, get permission, use a little bit of courtesy, let them know you're coming over. Now here's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that ayah, Allah explains a couple of rules and conditions when you're in the house. Then Allah azza wa jal says, believing men, lower your gaze. What's the connection? You're sitting in somebody's house, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell you, cover your eyes? Or at least... Lower your gaze. Be careful of what you see. Because think about what a lot of Muslims, or even a lot of people in general will do when you go over to somebody's house. You go inside the house and you start looking at their curtains and be like, my God, they shop at Walmart? You go inside the washroom and you look inside the cupboards and you're like, oh my God, Gillette? You know, and you're looking at their shaving set and all their hair. You just start examining things. You smell good food. So what do some brothers like to do? They kind of like to peek in the kitchen. What's cooking back there? Allah says, lower your gaze. Why? Because you might see something you're not supposed to see. She might be in the kitchen still cooking and she's not properly covered. She needs to go upstairs and put on something else. So Allah says, lower your gaze. Stick with the host. Stop looking around. Then Allah Azza wa Jal brings up a very important point. We'll come to it in a moment. I want you to understand this verse step by step, piece by piece. Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ He tells his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I want you to go tell the companions to lower their gaze. Why didn't Allah just say, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا غُدُّوا أَبْصَارَكُمْ وَحْفَظُوا فُرُوجَكُمْ Why didn't Allah just talk to you directly and say, O oh, you who believe, lower your gaze and protect your privates. Why did Allah put that person in the middle, his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Think about the subject in this, top, in this ayah. It's sensitive. How are you going to walk up to a brother and say, Akhi, I saw you checking out that sister. Fear Allah. I know she's beautiful, but you, watch out. You can't make that accusation on a brother that easily. Because his response might be, Akhi, what are you saying? Why are you accusing me of that? Is that what you think I am? Coming to the conference, coming to this lecture, coming to this place, just to stare at women? What are you saying, brother? So you can't do that to just anybody. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? If Allah azza wa spoke to you directly, there's a sense of authority behind it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this is a really sensitive issue. So you know what he does? He sends rahmatul lil alameen to do the job. You are the most merciful to mankind that I've put on this earth. You are the most merciful one. So I want you to go and do this job. Because you're the most sensitive. You remember the story of the little kitten? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he took off his upper garment and he put it on the ground. A little kitten came by and sort of snugged his way into the garment and fell asleep. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now wants to take the garment and put it back on his shoulders again. But he sees this little kitten sleeping there. So what does he do? 
he orders a companion to bring his sword. Now it's not what you're thinking. He's not going to say Bismillah, Allahu Akbar and just... No, that's not what we're talking about. The Prophet ﷺ says, take your sword and I want you to cut my garment around this kitten and whatever you do, don't wake it up. So the companion cuts the garment. Then the Prophet ﷺ tells the companion, okay, your job is done. He now, because he wants to ensure that this kitten doesn't wake up. So he picks up the garment himself and takes another piece of garment and sits there with a needle and thread and stitches it up himself. All what? Because he doesn't want to wake up the little kitten. If it was you and I, it would be a great opportunity to practice your NFL skills and kick that kitten out of its place. So Rahmatul Alameen goes up to the companions and says to them, Your master, your Rabb has said to you, says to you, Qul lil mu'mineen, to the believers, pause. So now you know why the Prophet ﷺ is in the middle. It's a sensitive issue. Another reason scholars say is this is how you start to respect the Prophet ﷺ. Listen to what he has to say. He says, Mu'mineen. Allah Azza wa Jal didn't say, Qul lil Muslimin. Allah said, Mu'mineen, believers. There's one thing that you want to know the difference between Mu'min and Inna Ladina Amanu. You know how in Quran you're always reading those verses? Inna Ladina Amanu wa Amilu Salihat. What's the difference? When you say inna ladina amanu in Quran, you're talking about the actual act of belief. So somebody recognizes that this is a good thing. It doesn't mean they're going to practice it. We all know Muslims like this. I know that hijab is important, but I'm not ready to do it. I can't do it. But my daughter, mashallah, tabarakallah, she's in her hijab. My son, he prays five times a day, alhamdulillah. Me, inshallah, one day I'll pray. You have inna ladina amanu. But you're not at the level of mu'min. Mu'min is when it's a quality in your life. It's a part of who you are. So you not only acknowledge it, but you also practice it. Allah Azza wa Jal says the subject of this ayah, this gender relations thing, is not a desire problem, it's an iman problem. You have a bankruptcy in your heart if you are comfortable free mixing with the opposite gender. Let me say that again. If you are comfortable and don't see any worry or problem being and mixing with the opposite gender, if it doesn't bring just a little bit of discomfort to your heart, you're, there is a problem with your iman. That's why Allah says, the people of this ayah, I'm already calling you mu'min. I'm already calling you people who have the qualities of Iman in your life. So now go back to the problem. Why do you think young kids today can't sort of control themselves? Why do you think this is such a fitna? Every billboard you see, every commercial you look at, every TV show, every movie, every song, there's always some sort of sexual profanity involved. Why is that so difficult for these kids? Because there's a bankruptcy happening in their heart. There's a bankruptcy in their Iman. You know why this is so important? Because you'll sit down with a brother or a sister and you'll quote to them every single ayah and hadith and you'll say to them, it's haram to have a boyfriend, it's haram to have a girlfriend. Allah said this, the Prophet said that. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to pick up their phone after and be like, you know what? You're the only person I can talk to. I can't stand Sheikh Muslah. I can't stand, every time I meet him, all he does is quote to me verses, but you, I love you, because you don't quote to me anything. That's what's going to happen. Your hadith and ayat aren't working. There's a problem with that person's iman. Listen to how Allah helps you solve it. What do you tell the believers? يَغُضُّ min absarihim. Pause. Allah didn't say, stop looking. Allah didn't say, cut your sight, close your eyes. Allah used the word yaghuddu from the word ghaddun. Ghaddun means to weaken something. Ghaddun also means to turn a different direction. So Allah Azza wa Jal in Quran doesn't tell you, stop looking at the opposite gender. Allah controls how you look at them. That's the key. In Quran, Allah doesn't say culture is haram. In Quran, Allah cleans up our culture. So you can have your culture, your practice, your tradition, but Allah cleans it up so that it's always halal, it's always appropriate. 
your eyes, Allah is not saying to you, stare at the ground when you're speaking to her. Allah doesn't say to you, turn the other direction or give her your back. Allah says that, look, when you're looking at that person, weaken the look. Don't sit there and stare at her all the time. Allah is saying to you, just weaken your sight. What that requires of you is to break the look. So sometimes you're looking, then you sort of turn away a little bit. You look again, you turn away a little bit. Do you know how much this word has solved problems of our relationship with the opposite gender? It solves every single problem. Now you can go to Timmy's, you can go to the grocery store, and you can stand in the lineup where the female cashier is there. The female cashier is there and you can actually get the change and you can actually say thank you to her without wearing gloves in the middle of the summertime so you don't touch her hand. This is the real dilemma, brothers and sisters. It's a real challenge. We're, we're, we're finding a huge, huge difficulty in how to get through these small little issues. So Allah Azza wa Jalla says, just look, just control your eyes. Because when you do that, listen to the rest of the ayah. And protect the privates. We just went from looking at the opposite gender to protecting the privates. That is a huge jump. That is a huge jump. When you look at the opposite gender, it doesn't mean that well, billah, you're suddenly going to do something haram with them. A lot of things have to happen in between. Remember the ayah, brothers, the audience is you. It's not the sisters yet. Sisters, we're coming to you. You have a, your own verse yourself we're coming to in a moment. Brothers, Allah is talking to you. And he's saying to you, look, control your eyes and protect the privates. One huge jump from the eyes to the privates. So what's happening in between? I want you to think about how a guy picks up a girl. I'm really bad at this, but I'm going to just try my best, okay? So imagine now, <laughs> you go to a conference. And the brother comes inside the conference and he sees a sister at the table and he's like, Assalamu alaikum sister, um, where is the musalla? He knows where the musalla is, but he just wants to talk to her and she's like, it's right in front of your face, go inside. So he goes inside, he doesn't need to pray, he does tawaf a couple times and he comes back out and he's like, mashallah, this is a beautiful masjid, I'm really hungry, where can I get something to eat? He knows where to go, but the sister's like, it's right over there go and eat he goes and he eats and he comes back he's like mashallah this is a great conference can you tell me a little bit more about it do you see what he's doing he's trying to manufacture and build conversation a plan so what happened with that sister now if it's a weak sister guess what she's gonna do well I'll take you around show you the bazaar we'll show you around this is a great conference we do it every year and da 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 next thing you know what happens it went from a conversation she gets off of her chair they start walking around jazakallah khayn you're the best tour guide in this world i want you i want you to just help me tour the entire world can i get your number <laughs> see i told you i was really bad at this i don't think this ever happens but even if it does they exchange numbers and then you know where it goes for you and i brothers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, well, before we get to that, in Arabic, this plan that we're putting together is called sun'atun. Arabs, when they see construction happening, they say this is a sana'a. Sana'a or sun'atun means to manufacture something from the ground up. How does the ayah end? Inna Allah khabirun bima yasna'oon. Allah is fully well aware of what you manufacture. So you can't get away from it. You could be sitting in that conference, but your eyes are just like, Allah oh, from this curtain, subhanAllah. And you're just kind of listening to Brother Muslah and Allah says, watch out, I know what you're doing. You're probably just saying salamu alaikum to her for the sake of Allah. Allah says, I know exactly what you're manufacturing. Why? Because us, we're very good at putting together this kind of plan. Why do you need to avoid that? The same ayah is saying, this is better for your hearts. This is a purification of your heart. So if you know you're in a situation that you can't handle, if you know you're going to college and uni, and that environment is really getting to you, guess what you need to do? Especially you, the brothers. You need to take a break. 
maybe quitting school is not your, your thing. It's not your option. And I don't encourage you to quit. But you probably just need a semester off. Take a break. Purify your heart. Go, come back to the masajid. Come back and recharge your iman again. Why? It's pure for you. Then what do you do? You can get back to it again. Sometimes you just need that break. Last point. And this here, I turned my attention to the sisters. Sisters, this is for you. The next ayah, Allah Azza wa Jal tells you the exact same thing. We don't need to explain it again. Say to believing women. Now you know why the ayah is calling towards mu'minat, believing women and not just Muslimas. Allah says, Same exact thing. But then instead of Allah Azza wa Jal talking about their hearts, Allah Azza wa Jal said to them, وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنْ عَلَى جُيُوبِهِنْ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا Pause. That's all I'm going to explain to you. Allah Azza wa Jal says, And don't make obvious your beauty. Don't expose your beauty except that which is obvious. Sisters, Allah is saying to you, Don't expose your beauty except that which is obvious. Now that which is obvious, scholars have differed on this tremendously. You have Aisha radiallahu anha said, the obvious beauty of a woman is her hands. It's even her feet, it's her face. Imam Shafi'i says something else. Imam Abu Hanifa says something else. That's not the topic of our discussion. Here Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, look. Wala yubadina. Sisters, pay attention to this because it's going to solve so many problems for you. The word yubdina comes from the word adna yudni, which means to make something clear and explicit and obvious. Allah says specifically when it comes to your beauty, your appearance, I want you to cover your appearance as much as possible, except for the things you can't do anything about. Some ulama included the face here. So if your face, you, you choose to expose it, Allah Azza wa Jal says, be careful. Don't, and we talked about this yesterday, don't put a patch of makeup all over your face and then you look like somebody completely different. This is why we restricted makeup to natural makeup. Something that still preserves the natural you. Freshening up is one thing, putting on makeup is something completely different. Here Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا Now I want you to really think about why this verse is so important. Today girls, when they put on their hijab, when they put on their hijab, they'll stand in front of the mirror for like 45 minutes. They'll pray istikhara, they'll go into their closet and they finally choose the color of their hijab. And then they'll stand in front of the mirror for 45 minutes and try to work with this hijab. And if that doesn't help, they'll go on YouTube and type in like hijab tutorials. So you'll have like a conference style hijab, you'll have like a subway style hijab, you'll have like a sidewalk style hijab, a flying hijab, you'll have a hijab for every single occasion out there. A walking hijab, an exercising style hijab, all of it is out there. You're missing the point of your hijab which we're going to come to in a moment. But Allah Azza wa Jal is saying, إِلَّا مَا ظَهْرَ مِنْهَا there is an obvious beauty about you you can't do anything about. You can put on an astronaut suit and a brother might still look at you and say, MashaAllah, she's so beautiful. You can wear, you can literally dress like Iron Man and a brother will be like, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> Something beautiful about her. So that obvious beauty, Allah is saying, look, you can't do anything about that. The word zina in the ayah literally means Beautiful literally means something that is beautiful according to some scholars of Arabic They say that Zina specifically refers to a woman's pretty face So you could look like a zombie that you just woke out of a cocoon and you put on your hijab And you walk out and a brother will still look at you and say Masha Allah Tabarakallah You can't do anything about that anymore Allah Azza wa Jal is not going to account for you anymore. Allah Azza wa Jal is not going to hold you accountable for that. You've tried your best, the rest is left with Allah. You can't do anything. Many sisters have that sort of beauty attached to them. That level of beauty, no matter what they do, no matter what they wear, somebody's going to find beauty and attraction towards them. 
So Allah Azza wa Jal says, إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ مِنْهَا That's your obvious beauty, you can't do nothing about it. You want to know why that's so important, sisters? I want you to remember this for the rest of your life, insha'Allah. For those girls sitting here in this audience, who look for that validation from others, that you're beautiful. So a lot of girls today, young girls I'm talking about, that wear all that makeup and that have all these weird style hijabs, they do this for really one reason, so that others can look at them and say, MashaAllah, you're beautiful. They look for at least some kind of validation that they are beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Illa ma zahra minha. Allah Azza wa Jal says, You already have beauty in you. Allah is calling you beautiful, so what more of a validation do you want? Allah is already saying to you, you're beautiful. You don't need one of those counselors to sit down with you and be like, look, you may be ugly on the outside, but you're beautiful on the inside. It's okay. You don't need that. Allah said you're beautiful. Case closed. Then with the struggles of your hijab, look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمْرِهِنْ عَلَىٰ جُيُوبِهِنْ Brothers, we all know what khimar is, right? It's a handkerchief. No, it's not. It's not a handkerchief. Brother, brother at the back there is like, MashaAllah, I never knew that. Uh, a khimar is the head scarf, the head covering. Scholars differ exactly how it's supposed to fit. Back in the days before this ayah, women were also covering their heads. But what they did is they would put on the head covering and their, their hair would fall on the back. Allah said, take that khimar, Take that head covering and let it fall now in the front towards the juyubihin, that chest cavity. So take the same thing that they were wearing and let it fall now in the front for obvious reasons. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلْيَضْرِبْنَ Allah didn't say, وَلْيَلْبِسْنَ Allah didn't say, wear the khimar. Allah used the word yadrib from daraba. Sisters, daraba means something that moves consistently. Moves consistently back and forth all the time. That's why when you're in a fight, you say daraba. Because what are you doing? You're trying to go back and forth to the person as much as possible, right? So there's a characteristic of consistency involved with the word daraba. Now go back, we're talking about hijab, right? Imagine the sister. There are some sisters when they put on their hijab, they're on autopilot. So they stand in front of the mirror and it's like transformers. Cell phone. They're ready, they're gone. Then there are other sisters, they literally, they'll put on their hijab at home. By the time they get to the car, guess what happens? A little bit of hair starts sticking out. And she's like, oh my God, she tucks it back in. Then by the time they reach where they're going, some more hair comes falling out and they look like they have a goatee like Brother Musleh. I'm like, oh my God, I look like Sheikh Musleh now. Oh my God. And they're constantly battling with this hijab. They come to the conference every five minutes. They have to keep going to the washroom. And what are they doing? They're just fixing hijab all the time. That daraba, that consistency of you going back and forth with this hijab, what you find annoying with your hijab, Allah is calling it ibadah. You think it's so annoying that I have to keep battling with this hijab. Allah is saying, this is your ibadah. This is your struggle with your hijab. Be proud of it. Be proud of you wearing this khimar. Just to set the record straight, khimar here refers to the head covering. Jilbab in Surah Al-Ahzab is the body cover. Jilbab, shoulders down, body cover. What came down first? Allah told the women to wear the jilbab first before the khimar. Girls today, when you tell them to wear hijab, what's the first thing they think about? I'm going to wear a baseball cap. As long as my hair is covered, I'm all good. I'll just cover this. But the rest of this is just exposed and it's all okay. You're missing the point of your hijab. Hijab is not a garment that you just wear and you fulfilled it. It's an attitude. Hijab is an attitude. So when you wear this body garment, if you want to train your kids or yourself to wear hijab, start off with the shoulders down. This will come naturally. Your head covering your khimar will fall into its place. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats it again. وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ إِلَّا مَا ظَهَرَ وَلَا يُبْدِينَ زِينَتَهُنَّ 
illa li bu'ulatihin. And this is what I conclude with. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeats it again, sisters. Don't expose your beauty except, Allah didn't say except, which is obvious. Now Allah Azza wa Jal says, except to your bu'ula. What's bu'ula? Comes from the word ba'lun. Ba'lun literally means a plant that isn't dependent on water. So think about here, um, it's like the evergreen tree. You don't really have to water that tree. It's fine, it's dependent. Once a year, if it gets a little bit of water, it's okay. Here in this ayah, bu'ula is plural for husbands. It's another term used for the husband. Why didn't Allah just use the term that you and I are accustomed to, which is zawjun? Here, ba'lun, Allah Azza wa Jalla is saying, look sisters, your beauty is like the water or nourishment that your husband will appreciate from you. You're his water, you're his nourishment. So reserve that nourishment just for him. Your bu'ula. And then you and I, brothers, the, the real interesting thing why ba'lun is used is now you become dependent on her. You're not looking for water from anyone else. You'll only find it in your spouse, in your wife. You won't find no satisfaction in anyone else. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told you and I, whenever you have the need or desire for a woman, go to your wife. Go to her. She is the one that's going to satisfy and, re and put aside all of those urges. And the same thing for the women, Allah ﷺ orders you to do the exact same thing. Go to your husband. At least you can get that out of your mind and focus on the relationship and other things. So I want to conclude. When it comes to this topic of gender relations in Islam, brothers and sisters, the Quran is very clear and it's very explicit. I told you yesterday, you forget Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will cause you to forget yourself. You will literally just become like an animal living in this world. You'll just walk around, you'll look at a guy, you'll look at a girl and it's just gonna feel all right and you'll just go with the flow. If you don't have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life, in your heart, if you're not praying, if you're not going through the struggle of being and remaining as Muslim, you're going to forget yourself. You're just going to be like an animal, like a zombie, walking around and you'll lose every sort of satisfaction and fulfillment in your heart for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Wake up. That's what these conferences are here for. It's to wake you up. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wake our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala flourish our hearts with his remembrance. And as a result, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purify our actions and our deeds. Allahumma ameen. So these are the words, brothers and sisters, I leave you with. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.